we'll keep it we'll keep it going then yeah you may notice my hotel lights change yeah <laughs> it, it changes from a a nice natural light to uh post hell all right let's say hello to everyone hi hello everyone welcome welcome we are happy you're here yeah so again for all of you continuing to join i'm anthony hello this is my I'm brother andrew hi guys andrew is awesome he's been uh touring some schools around the nation talking to some people um learning a lot coaching folks as we do and helping everybody get into drama school yeah uh, very excited we're very excited tonight's gonna be great we'll give everybody about 30 more seconds to join and then we will get started if you don't mind putting your location in the chat box so we know where you're located some of you guys are on the east coast central west coast we'll get started shakespeare 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 yeah yeehaw <laughs> man i'm excited something i love yeah and might i say you are fantastic at it man so thank you very much <laughs> Andrew uh, recently showed me a piece of his, and I was, I was very impressed. I have yeah, to. Yeah, man. <laughs> I, uh, I was, I was, you know, it's always good because you know you you have a lot of fun, and if you have fun, that's the key. You know, that's what I hope to get across today. Yes. So let's get into it, shall we? Yeah, please. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for being here. Um, you are live here because you are getting into drama school. That is why yeah. we're here. Or you're a teacher who's helping people get into drama school. We are uh, actors and we were there. We were 17 years old, actors in high school, doing our best with what we had. We were passionate to no end. And um, we just, we worked hard on our own and, we auditioned for schools. As you know, the story already goes. Andrew went to Cal Arts, a top school. I went to Juilliard and we learned even more and it's been phenomenal. So that moment in our lives was very special. We know where you're at, we're here for you and we're just gonna dive right into the content. Are you ready, Andrew? Let's do it. Cool, so the goal of tonight for me is that if you're an actor, if you're a young actor, you really understand Shakespeare better after tonight so that you can perform Shakespeare better. If you know how to break down his text and you know some of the tricks that Shakespeare uh, kind of used and some of the clues that he left, you'll be able to understand the language. You'll be able to perform the language. You'll be able to make more specific and informed choices as an artist that really makes your performance more uh, attractive and, and way more involving emotionally andrew what if anything are you adding to the goal for tonight yeah i definitely want to focus in on language understanding um what's in front of you what's on the page and uh understanding how that can translate to your body and and translate to your choices yes so hope you have a pen and paper because we are getting started um That's right there's four stages of learning. You may have heard this. You may have not. Um, you need to write these down and remember these for the rest of your life. This is not specific to Shakespeare, but it is specific to life. And it definitely is specific in this conversation because we're about to learn a lot of stuff. So write these four stages of learning down. You are in one of these four stages at all times. So the first stage is unconscious incompetence. If you don't know how to spell it, don't worry. Just give it your best shot. Unconscious <laughs> incompetence. That means you are not even aware that you can't do something. So if you're not even aware that you can't do something, you are in the first stage of learning, which is unconscious incompetence. Second stage of learning, conscious incompetence, meaning you have now become aware that you don't know how to do something. 
So you might learn something and realize, wow, I didn't even know that existed. And now I'm aware that I don't know how to do that. Second stage is uh, conscious incompetence. Third stage, conscious competence, meaning you are now aware that you can do something. You've worked, you've practiced, you've talked to others, and you've really synthesized your learning and, and you found out that you can execute something successfully. You are now aware that you can do something. Your conscious competence. Yeah. Last stage of learning is unconscious competence. You don't even think about it. You can do it. It's like driving. Well, yeah. maybe for some of you. Uh, <laughs> like walking, like breathing, you know, yeah. things that you don't even aware. You're not even aware. You just, you just do it. You're just, unconscious competence. It's, it's second nature. So can you see how those are the four stages of learning? And, and with any skill, with any knowledge, you're in one of those four stages. And the goal is to kind of move yourself through those four and, and work to help yourself get more knowledgeable about whatever topics you're interested in. So if you're interested in performing Shakespeare better, you might be in one of those stages. We're going to help you get to the next stage tonight. So let's dive in. First topic, first overall topic, verse versus prose. Write it down. Verse versus prose. You should be able to look at a Shakespearean text, open a, any Shakespeare play. Immediately upon looking, you should be able to visually recognize whether or not you're looking at verse or you're looking at prose. So let's talk about what verse and prose are. Verse is heightened speech. Verse is heightened speech. That's the sort of most easiest way to put it. You need to understand that verse is heightened. Prose is not as heightened. Prose is not as heightened. They look different on the page. You should be able to recognize how they look on the page. So the way they look on the page is, Andrew, how would you describe the differences the way they look on the page? Yeah, so uh, verse uh, on the left side of the page, we read left to right. It all lines up in a straight line, right? And it goes out from there, but it always comes back to this straight line. Usually each of the first words have a capital. Um, and then a piece of prose is like how we read a novel today is what you would normally see is just a piece of prose. Like it looks like a paragraph. Exactly. It looks like a block. Yeah. When you visually look at it, there's really, there's, it's full block. Whereas right. with verse, like Andrew's saying, it's, it's a block on one side, but then it, each line kind of ends at a different point. Mm -hmm. and the beginning of each line starts with a capital letter. That's how you know, visually, you're looking at verse. And again, me and Andrew, we're in the fourth stage of learning with this <laughs> we don't even think about it we just say oh yeah it's a verse oh yeah it's prose like it's not even and you should be too by yeah. you know the end of tonight it should be second nature just to recognize prose versus verse okay sure um college audition pieces should be what no don't answer andrew oh my bad <laughs> what i know that we're not uh really being able to hear what you're saying right now, but can you we guess what know. college audition pieces should be verse or prose? I won't go too long in making you guess, but it should be Andrew. It should be in verse. It should be in verse. Okay. Why, why not do an awesome prose monologue from Midsummer Night's Dream or much ado about nothing. It's really cool stuff. It's hilarious. Fall staff. <laughs> oh my gosh. It'd be hilarious because guys, they're asking you to do a classic monologue. It should be Shakespeare and it should be verse because mm -hmm. there's a lot more to handle with verse and it's heightened text. They want to see if you can go there. So it is not my opinion. This is happening in college auditions all over the country. If somebody brings in a Shakespearean prose it's likely that the school will ask you, do you have something in verse? They'll do it in a nice way, but 
they probably want to see how you handle the heightened language that is Shakespearean verse. Mm. So if you have questions, keep them, uh, keep them written down and we'll make sure to answer them. If you, uh, don't have my email or if you don't have my phone number, um, we will make sure to connect after this. You can email me or you can call me. It's on the website, how to get into drama school.com. Please mm. contact me with any questions after this, but we have kind of a lot to cover in a short amount of time. So I want to make sure you get the essentials and then we'll definitely um, connect moving on. So Andrew, um, give me one reason why a character may be speaking in verse as opposed to prose could be talking to royalty it could be royalty um could have that that place of class uh in the class system um could also be doing something uh you know two uh diplomats talking to each other about a new law you know right so what andrew's saying is that you could be showing respect to someone and therefore mm -hmm. speaking verse or mm -hmm. you could be a person of higher social standing, like a lord or a king or whatever, and you you speak verse to reflect your your social standing and to display to others your facility of language. Mm -hmm. um, also, like Andrew was saying, you might be talking about a specific topic that is very verse worthy. Mm -hmm. So, and the reason we're covering this, guys, is because when you look at your verse monologues you may wonder, well, this character speaks in prose most of the time. Why is he speaking in verse here? Well, that's actually an actor choice. You need to understand. Important. He's not speaking prose right now. He's speaking in verse. That probably indicates to me as the actor, I need to either understand he's acting regal or maybe he's speaking mm -hmm. to someone way above him. You know, you mm -hmm. need to consciously make that specific choice. Why is he speaking in verse? Anyway, um, another reason is there's a very heightened emotional moment. Right. Prose speakers might switch to verse when they are just super zoning in on some sort of emotion. Um, there are a million different reasons why. And ultimately it is up to the artist to make the choice. But Shakespeare does give you the clue. Uh, for example, when people are having witty banter, mm -hmm. you know, like, um, in Romeo and Juliet, there's a lot of witty banter between oh, yeah. Joe and Bonvolio and Tybalt and everybody, and especially Mercutio, like loves to banter in verse. It's part of, it's almost like a sport. So, yeah, he loves shared lines. He loves the shared, shared lines in the verse works a lot better than in prose. Yes. Shared lines is definitely something that is important to learn, but actually in college auditions, since you're not having any dialogue, it's dialogue, just like, right, 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 right. Your lines right. will be something you learn some other time. <laughs> That's um, right. You don't already <laughs> know what they are. Um, so Andrew, why would, give me one reason why somebody, a character would speak in prose. Yeah. Uh, if they're, uh, you know, if you look at a lot of the fools, they're trying to entertain or be funny or, you know, they are of a lower social class. But I think about, you know, when I think about prose, I think about, uh, you know, Gabo with his, his uh, shoe and his dog, you know, he's a, right. he's a performer. He's trying to make people laugh. He makes a living on it. So prose is easily understood by the high class and the low class. It can be something that can be understood by everyone. Yeah, it's a great example. Maybe you're a prose speaker, but you're speak, I'm sorry, a, a verse speaker, but you're speaking in prose so mm -hmm. that the people you're talking to who are maybe lower social standing can understand. For example, Hamlet, when he right. has the speech called Speak the Speech, I Pray You, and he's mm -hmm. talking to the um, actors in the company, the, the, the groundlings, they don't yeah. speak verse. They're not, they're, they're just groundlings and they're performers. Right. So they understand prose. So that's why Hamlet, who can speak verse, speaks in prose when he's talking to his groundlings because he's speaking plainly so that they understand right. it. Um, some other reasons people might speak prose. Um, it might be a, a lower social standing. They just don't know how to. The topic of conversation might be like beer and whatever. And it might just be right. more of a topic of conversation as opposed to talking about dreams and fairies. Um, and also it might actually be Shakespeare indicating to the actors that this moment is not as heightened as the next moment in the scene when I switch to verse. 
so that he might want the actors to play a little more casual or play a little more comical right before making a distinct switch to verse, at which point we should feel a different type of vibe or, or moment change in the mm. scene. So hope that makes sense. By the way, I appreciate the comments. Some people are, you know, chiming in. Oh, I wish um, I could see them. Yeah. <laughs> Love you guys. All right. So continuing on. If a character goes back and forth between prose and verse in the play, mm -hmm. such as Romeo, such as Hamlet, a lot of different characters, as you like it, Rosalind. Um, the real question that you as the actor want to ask yourself, if the character is going back and forth through prose versus poetry is, why is the character speaking prose in this moment? Or why is the character speaking in verse in this moment? Right. Ask yourself that question. If you ask yourself that question, you will unlock your creativity and you will start to think, well, probably because he's talking to the Duke. So he's choosing to speak in verse right now because the Duke is in front of him. So he probably not only is going to be speaking in verse, but how would that affect your attitude? Mm hmm. How would that affect your intention? How would that affect your physical gesturing? Right. It puts you in relationship to someone specific. And sometimes right. just knowing the text can give you that information. And this is where a lot of people who do college auditions, you know, just totally miss the boat. Right. They don't realize that this character that they're playing is actually more of a prose character if they read the play mm -hmm. but in this particular moment they're speaking verse and they're not treating it like anything special or they're not actually relating to the person they're talking to in a in a in a very high stakes way right would you agree andrew absolutely absolutely it's a big thing i see in a lot of high school actors that i've seen across the country is you know uh the, the question of have have you read the play right, you know, right. there are you gotta get to the play this is so important you're you're gonna learn so much more i mean i mean books so many books are sold on just monologue books but i promise those are just to bait you to be able to read the play and understand the character of course if it hasn't been told to you yet it should be told to you now and you should remember it forever do not do a monologue for college without having read the play now these there's a different love plays. Sorry. These people love plays. They want to talk to you about them. They may ask you about the circumstances or whatever. Now there's a different yeah. conversation that is, you know, well, in the context of the play, this monologue is X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. We can talk about that later, but regardless, yeah. you should know your play. So if you haven't read the play that you're doing a monologue from make sure you do and make sure you know it well. All right, moving on. So, um, Oh, so this is actually a great example when we're talking about, um, switching from verse to prose, let's just talk about verse for the rest of our time together. Okay. And, and the reason why is because in college auditions, we know that they want us to do verse. And it is heightened language and it kind of shows off that you can handle heightened text more than verse. Mm -hmm. So, Andrew, what are the two types of verse? We got yeah. rhyming verse, rhyming verse and blank verse. Write it down, everybody. Rhyming verse mm -hmm. and blank verse. Those are the Very two important. types of verse. Now, if you're wondering in your head, because you're an advanced student, what about iambic pentameter? Just reel it back, reel it back. We're not there yet. <laughs> Verse in general here with Shakespeare, we're talking about blank and rhyming. So rhyming is rhyming, obviously. The ends of the lines rhyme. Right. Um, blank verse is any verse that doesn't rhyme. Okay. So in one speech, a character 
can go from blank verse to rhyming verse. Now in your head, why? Well, the question is, as an actor, when you're looking at that, you got to ask yourself, why? What's going on in the, the speech that would make him transition or her transition from blank to rhyming in that moment? What's going on? So again, asking yourself that question will unlock creativity and you will make a choice of some sort that is like, oh, you know what I think it is? He's probably realizing that she's not going to be with him forever. So he works to get into rhyming verse to sound even more beautiful and do his best to keep her. You know, like whatever it is, you have to make a choice because Shakespeare is telling you something. Shakespeare is giving you a clue by transitioning the speech. So, for example, the, the monologue I did for college auditions, Richard II, alack, why am I sent for to a king? Before I have shook off the regal thoughts, blah, 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 blah. and in the end, he says, the last two lines of the whole piece are in rhyming verse. The rest of the speech is in blank verse. Mm -hmm. The last two lines are, God save the king, although I be not he, yet amen, if heaven do think him me. So I asked myself, whoa, Shakespeare's telling me something here. It now rhymes. So something has to happen. Maybe it's super noticeable to the audience. Maybe it's not, but it has to be. That's something that's changed in that character. Shakespeare's telling you that. If you skip right. over that or you just try to do your own idea, you're probably missing the more rich choice. So when I did it, right, when I went from blank to rhyming, the first words of that two-line rhyme was, God save the king, although I be not he. Yet, amen, if heaven do think him me. I chose to scream. I'm talking to this group of people. I've been trying to keep my cool this entire time and just speak in blank verse, not show off. And then with those last two lines, I fully demonstrate my facility of language, my prowess with rhyming couplets and my power as a former king at the top volume of my voice. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have probably made that choice if I didn't understand blank verse versus rhyming verse. Right. Does that make sense, everybody? Hopefully you're nodding your head, but I can't see you, which I wish <laughs> I could. But make comments. And if you have anything to say, we'll make sure to follow up with everybody. That's blank versus rhyme verse. Okay. Andrew and I are now going to move into the next section. Yeah. Which is for all those of you who have been waiting for the magic phrase, iambic pentameter. For those of you who have never heard that, you're probably like, what are we nerding out on right now? Massive nerd out. Okay. But this is super important. It's not as much about nerding out on iambic pentameter as it is about understanding some reality. Yeah, uh, you know, let's talk about what it is. Iambic pentameter. Iambic pentameter. It's two words, by the way. Iambic pentameter. Iambic pentameter are poetry lines that are written in a ten-syllable, unstressed, stressed pattern. So, if you want to write that down, iambic pentameter are poetry lines written in a 10 syllable unstressed stressed pattern you'll get to understand what we mean here in a second we'll give some examples um essentially my way of saying it is iambic pentameter represents the rhythm of the verse mm -hmm. helps you understand what rhythm shakespeare is going after here Sometimes in modern plays, we want to take our own pauses because we understand the moment. And we want to feed through something because we think we really understand the moment. Actually, Shakespeare is unique in that by using iambic pentameter, he'll tell you when to pause. Because 
the iambic pentameter will have either a space or you'll see in a second, but like, it's the rhythm. So yeah. Shakespeare chose to write in iambic pentameter. He is not the only one. Tons of other contemporaries of, of Shakespeare's back in the day wrote in iambic pentameter. It was the language of the day. The people understood it. Cool. And it has a really good rhythm. So let's talk about the rhythm. The rhythm is broken down into 10 syllables. So think about one verse line on the page, just one line of iambic pentameter. It's broken up into 10 syllables. Okay. And it sounds like a beating heart. Just remember that iambic pentameter is like a beating heart. It sounds like ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum. So it's unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum. 10 syllables, unstressed, stressed. So let's look at a Shakespearean verse line. Let me think of a really regular, Andrew, if you have a regular iambic pentameter off the top of your head, shoot it out. Um, um, I've got one. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. So the, the first line of, of my speech from Richard II, alack, why am I sent for to a king? So here's how, here's how it beats out. A lap. Why am I sent forth to a king? Ten syllables in one line. Unstressed, stressed syllable. Unstressed mm -hmm. syllable, stressed syllable. I know this might be a little bit slow for those of you who have heard it before. Um, but for those of you who haven't, hopefully you're picking it up. Andrew, what was your line? Um. Well, now, now, actually, I think it's a, it's a one, it's one above. So we're, we're it's a little. Got it, got it. Too, too um, so again, a lack. Why am I sent forth to a mm -hmm. king? Right. That is a regular iambic pentameter line. Shakespeare's lines are mostly regular iambic pentameter. Okay, Andrew, would you add any a Anything else to the definition of how to understand iambic pentameter? Um, yeah, I think that there are uh, a few resources that I want to throw out there. And I just want to, I want you guys to look up metric feet. So there's a lot of things you can look up. There's quite a few. We won't get into specifics today. Um, but in those iambic pentameter, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of clues in there. And he lays those clues in. And the more you know about metric feet, the more you'll kind of understand how that can influence your choices as you play the language. Great. When Andrew says metric feet, <clears throat> he's kind of, ref if you break that phrase down, he's referring to the meter. Right. You know, poetry is written in meter. And this specific type of meter is iambic, pentameter, pentameter. So if you break down the whole word, iamb, I-A-M-B means two. Mm -hmm. It's bump. just an old, the etymology of the word is two. And, right. and when Andrew's talking about metric feet, he's talking about this unit of two, iambic pentameter. Penta meaning five, pentameter. So it's the type of meter that is five feet. Yep. Five sets of two. So it's iambic pentameter. Right. I hope that's clear. If it's not, call me. We'll talk. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> let's talk about, let's move on to a really, really important, uh, I don't know, information about helping you make better choices as an actor. Mm with Shakespeare. If you understand what a regular iambic pentameter line is, you need to understand what an irregular iambic pentameter line is. Why do you think you need to understand what an irregular iambic pentameter line is? And I'll let you think about that. Why 
if you know what a regular line is, why would it be important to understand what an irregular line is? If in your head you're thinking, well, it's just like verse, blank verse and rhyming verse. Once it switches, that's probably Shakespeare trying to tell me something. So when it goes from a regular iambic pentameter line to an irregular iambic pentameter line, it definitely is Shakespeare trying to tell you something. It's a clue. Make a choice. So here's what's good. Here's the good news. Shakespeare has been writing. Uh, Shakespeare writ, wrote, you know, 400 years ago, 500 years ago. Why can't I do math in my head right now? 400 years ago. People have studied his works for 400 years. Yeah. So fortunately for us, there's a lot of just easy ways to understand the irregularities. Right. So you need to make sure you understand the following terms. Make sure you write it down. And when you recognize these irregularities, you can then make a choice as to, okay, it looks like this character is doing something different here. So Andrew. Yeah. Um, we're going to talk about the first term and you're going to help them define it. Um, everybody write down the word feminine ending. Two words. Sorry. Feminine ending. Yes. Trochee. Well, trochee will be next. Feminine, oh. ending. feminine ending is the 11th. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. You want to do trochee? Uh, yeah. Why don't you do trochee? All right. So let's stick with feminine yeah, ending for a quick second before we move on to trochee. Sorry what about is, that. That's okay. What is a feminine ending? A feminine ending is an extra syllable at the end of the line. Mm -hmm. So how many syllables are in an iambic pentameter line? 10. How many syllables are in a line with a feminine ending? 11. So for the most famous example of a feminine mm -hmm. ending Shakespearean line is to be or not to be. That is the question. So as an actor, you ask yourself, wow, I recognize mm -hmm. that there's a feminine ending at the start of the speech. He's not even starting with regularities and going into irregularities. He's starting irregular. Yeah. You can make that observation just by understanding text and that will inform you as an actor. Okay. If he's starting irregular, what kind of emotional state is he starting in? Yeah. Probably not a regular one. <laughs> Probably starting in some sort of off or yeah. extra. And also, could it inform how you say the line? Yeah. Right. To be or not to be. That is the question. You get to play with it. You get to experience it. You get to experiment. It's your choice as an actor. There is no right way or wrong way. What this text analysis essentially does for you is open up like the text so that you can say, well, there's something here I should understand how we're doing how i want to yeah. do that so that's a feminine ending does everybody understand what that is it's the 11th syllable at the end of a iambic pentameter line it's a feminine ending okay andrew trochee so everybody spell trochee t r o c h e e and this is the benefit of having youtube and not a dry erase board, which I would obviously just write it on the chalkboard. So T as in Tom, R-O-C-H-E-E, -E, trochee. Andrew, hit it. What's a trochee? Yeah, it's a one syllable shy of 10. It's a nine syllable ending. Uh, so your line is, you know, your metric meter is nine syllables, which uh, can mean, you know, quite a few things. It could mean that uh, they're I think there's a few nine syllables in Romeo and Juliet when Juliet is on the balcony. 
it's a very high intense situation you know it's just gotta it get it's gotta get out of here you gotta get like she's trying to end the conversation so um there there's uh it's it's a reveal of circumstance in a lot of ways for me is what i look for nine syllables great 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 now uh let's talk about another term yeah. write it down alexandrine yeah yeah spelled a l e x a n no wait no uh-huh. yeah i was right trust me right, a l e x a n d r i n e alexandrine what is an alexandrine an alexandrine is an extra two syllables at the end of the line it's fireworks <laughs> Fireworks. <laughs> How many syllables are in an iambic pentameter line? Ten. How many syllables are in an Alexandrine line? Twelve. Remember when Andrew was talking about metric feet and how there's five metric feet? Mm-hmm. Five, like I ams. An Alexandrine is six. There's six metric feet. So what does this mean? If I see an Alexandrine, it means that, I mean, it's up to you. You're the artist, but here's what a lot of wisdom has taught us about when Shakespeare writes this in. It's typically because a character is overflowing. A character cannot stop. A character will probably not pause after an Alexandrine. They will run right into the beginning of the next line and it will Mm -hmm. be an overflow. So that probably also tells you something about their emotional state. It's just, you know, it it can't be stopped. Maybe stream of consciousness type of speed. Um, Right. Now, this is not a hard and fast rule, guys. None of this is hard and fast rules. Like, okay, so if it's a feminine ending, I have to go question. You know, no. It's not, it's, it's all just clues to help you clues. So take, if you can recognize these, that's the skill you want. And then once you recognize them, you as the artist get to say, okay, I actually see why he is having an Alexandrine there because he's probably furious and he's ripping the person he's talking to. So yeah, then I think you get to do that. Now you yeah, understand what choice you're going to make because Shakespeare gave you the, the clue. Now you can feel free to rip that person you're talking to apart and not stop when you move to the, because you're, you have an Alexandrian line. Okay. Um, okay. Let's talk about monosyllabic lines. So everybody write down that term monosyllabic. And by the way, before we get into this, I want to answer a question that um, Christian uh, texted or put in the comments. He said, do we have to use this rhythm when performing the monologue? (laughs) It's a good question. Like, in other words, do you have to say like, alack, why am I sent for to a king? Um, To be or not to be, that is the question. (laughs) No, please don't do this, Christian. Um, Do not, uh, this is actually a good teaching moment because it's important that you do not show your text analysis in your performance. Very, very true. Not show your text analysis in your performance. Your performance is about the rich emotional life of your character and what they want. Mm -hmm. That's all an audience should be witnessing. If an audience thinks to themselves, wow, is that a feminine ending? (laughs) You're not they're really doing what you're trying the character's doing you're not really in the emotional you're not doing what the performance is right so these rhythms and irregularities are just there to help you understand where the character could be going in this monologue with that being said when it's time to perform you hopefully have done all your homework and it's mm-hmm. solid in you right? so that it just, you roll with it. Okay, back to our terms. We're almost done here. 
Mm -hmm. By the way, our goal is to be done within the hour. So seven o'clock, we're going to be done. Uh, we might get done before that because I think we're a little ahead of schedule. So I think we're doing hey. very good. Hopefully everyone is keeping up. I want to check in. Is uh, Give me a thumbs up in the comment thread or give me a, some sort of comment with how you're doing. Is everybody present uh, as we move forward? All right. So Andrew, uh, monosyllabic lines. Everybody oh, spell yeah. out monosyllabic. It's one word, M-O-N-O-S-Y-L-L-A-B-I-C. Monosyllabic. What is a monosyllabic line, Andrew? Yeah, it's um, one-syllable words, 10 one-syllable words. So if we take to be or not to be, I mean, those are all, that's a monosyllabic line until the end right? Right. Uh, which is a huge, like, and you should see these things and know that monosyllabic, you know, the way it was described to me just means slow down, take your time, and really understand what is happening in front of you, you know, to be or not to be, that is the question, you know what I'm saying? It's like, those are there's a lot of them throughout Shakespeare, especially in these profound moments in these characters' lives or in their circumstances or in death or in new life or in marriage. Monosyllabic is something he uses quite often. Right. So if you recognize that a line has only one syllable words, the whole line, that should stand out to you. Uh-oh, we have a monosyllabic line here. Mm -hmm. Andrew said, slow down. I think that's fair. It should probably also clue you to the fact that it's like columns. Boom, 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 boom. So not just the rhythm of slowing down, but more the, the weight. I like that. I like that a lot. The weight of the word. I'm trying to think of a line in my Richard the Second speech, I think there is one. Um, yeah, I'm thinking about. I'm thinking through it too. Let's um, come up with a monosyllabic line here, real quick. Uh, yeah, it's uh, the last. Um, oh man, I mean, uh, of course, put on the spot. Um, I have, I have it. I have Shakespeare right here. I could probably find one. I just, I'm literally opening the computer. I, I, yeah. See if you can find one. I, I actually don't have one in my mind. Like I thought I did. Um, so anyway, hope you got a nice breather there while we were off in the clouds. <laughs> okay. Monosyllabic. Uh, that's great. Andrew's going to find one and interrupt me when he does. Um, so let's move on to the next one. A budding consonants. Mm-hmm. Spelled a budding A B U T T I N G a butting second word consonants C O N S O N A N T S a budding consonants. Everybody knows what a consonant is, it's any letter that's not a vowel A E I O U vowels, every other letter consonants. A budding consonants are when the end of one word, that letter is the same consonant as the beginning of the next word. So like, um, like that Tom, the end of the word that is a T, and the beginning of the next word is Tom. It's the beginning letter is also T. They are a budding mm -hmm. consonants. So like, oh, that Tom is, oh, that Tom. So if you notice that you've got a budding consonants, which again, are the last letter of a word is the same letter as the beginning of the next word. Mm -hmm. 
And to be even more specific, because it is important to be even more specific here, the last sound of that word is the same sound as the next word because like that, anyway, it ends with a T and it doesn't start, it starts with a T, but the sound is actually the, or it's, yeah. it's you know, whatever. So it's gotta be the and same sound. I found a monosyllabic. It's- Okay, it hit us with the monosyllabic. It's the start of Macker's famous speech. Uh, if it were done, when tis done, then twere well. That's yes. 10 syllables. Brilliant. It's an in-jam line, but that's the end of the 10 syllables. So did everybody understand how that's a monosyllabic line? A line that is made up entirely of one syllable words? Say it again, Andrew. Yeah. If it were done, when tis done, then twere well. So the question you have to ask yourself if you come across a monosyllabic line is what? does this mean for me mm -hmm. who what is he character. going through in this moment what is he conveying mm. and the weight of what he's doing probably needs some of your attention right um i am thinking of a budding consonant example right now Okay, I got one. <laughs> so in my monologue, um, I say my one of the lines is give sorrow, leave a while to tutor me to this submission. Mm. So he's asking sorrow to take a break from whatever sorrow is doing and come be with me while I submit my kingly status. So give sorrow, leave a while to tutor me to this submission. Right. The abutting consonants, can you hear in the line where the abutting consonants are, guys? Give sorrow, leave a while to tutor me to this submission. The end of one of those words is the same sound as the beginning of the next word. So let's identify where the abutting consonants are. It's between the words this and submission. Give sorrow leave a while to tutor me to this submission. Mm. And that's the point of an abutting consonant. It's to actually let you either emphasize the second word in some special way or to separate the two words, or to mm. somehow, some way, he's using a poetic uh, device, which is called a budding consonance, and he's doing it for a reason. He could have used any other word rather than submission, which flows better. Mm. But he, he's giving you a clue to sort of maybe break up this submission. Mm. And there. Actually choosing the word submission he mm. could have chosen any other words but because he of who he's looking at he wants to really drive it into their hearts i'm just submitting give sorrow leave a while to tutor me to this or maybe he can't come up with it this submission right mm -hmm. however you want to do it but just recognize oh a budding consonants. Let me play with that. Right. All right. Oh my gosh, guys. Can you believe it? We have one more word. That's it. Excuse me. You're uh, taking your headphones off to not make that lighter. Oh, no. <laughs> Dang it. Um, but bless you. Thanks, man. Okay. Um, last word. Sejura. You guys are learning a whole new language. Um. Sejura, if you have not heard of this word, I'll spell it out for you. Please. Uh, C A. What? C A. Yes. C A E S U R A. 
So a sejura. Yes. You'll sound fancy when you say it. A sejura. Oh, was that a sejura? <laughs> <laughs> um, what is a sejura? A sejura is found in most verse lines, pretty much every verse line. Yeah. Um, but not, it's not a rule. But pretty much it's in every verse line. It's a... Uh, it's a natural but brief pause. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wherever you kind of, it, it can be found in the middle. It can be found towards the end of the line. It can be found towards the beginning of the line. It's a natural but brief pause. Okay. We're not going to milk this pause, but it often helps the actor to control the flow of thought. It helps the actor to make sense of what they're saying. It helps the listener to really receive the thought. So in the, since we're just beating uh, to be or not to be yeah. you know, like a dead horse, we'll go with that one. So where would the sejura be in the line to be or not to be, that is the question. Think to yourself, if a sejura is a natural but brief pause, mm -hmm. where in the line would the sejura be? To be or not to be, that is the question. If you're thinking to yourself, right before the word that, and right after the word be, you would be correct. So it's to be or not to be. Sejura. That is the question. So again, it's not going to be a long pause. It's a yes, correct, Anita, after B. Mm -hmm. um, great. Good job, everybody. So to be or not to be. It's not a long pause. Okay, please, for the love of Shakespeare. Do not make the sejuras a long pause. Right. If you have not already watched a Shakespeare play and felt the anger as an audience member at way too many pauses in Shakespeare, then just go with my advice and do not make a long pause when your sejura happens. But right. use the natural pause to make sense of something. So... In the line, the, the first line of the speech that I used, which was, Alack, why am I sent for to a king? Alack, why am I sent for to a king? Where mm -hmm. would the sejura be in that line? Would it be towards the end? Again, the line is, Alack, why am I sent for to a king? Would it be in the middle? Would it be in the beginning? If you're thinking towards the beginning, after the word alack, you would be correct. Hey. So it's alack. Why am I sent for to a king? Not alack. Why am I sent for to a king? Or not mm -hmm. alack. Why am I sent for to a king? Mm -hmm. Some choices there. Some choices to make. But again, those are not natural. Right. You want to put the caesura where the natural brief pause would be. And if that helps inform your delivery, if it helps inform you as an actor and where your character is at, use it. Right. Again, exactly. Everybody is saying after a lack. Great. So... That is the end of the irregularities. You've got your terms and we are on time. Uh, I hope you all have learned something today. We're not done. We're going to give you a couple resources so that you yeah. know what we were using when we were studying, uh, or, sorry, preparing for college auditions. Right. And, you know, when we have our monologue of Shakespeare in front of us, we also have some resources next to us on our desk. Always. And uh, I didn't know about these resources until somebody more experienced than me told me, hey, why don't you have X, Y, Z? So right. we, we uh, believe that there are some essential resources that you need to have in your library and on your desk if you're 
wanting to be serious about giving Shakespeare your best. So Andrew, what are some of the resources we have? Yeah, I have them on my desk right now, actually. Um, first okay. and foremost is my complete works of William Shakespeare. I trust the Norton. That's just something that CalArts was very adamant about. They, uh, they really like Stephen Greenblatt, which is one of the editors here. Um, he also wrote an award-winning book called Will in the World by Stephen Greenblatt. He, uh, this is an incredible book uh, about how Shakespeare became Shakespeare. It gives a lot of background about you know, the time, the writer himself. I mean, the more I learn about him, the more I understand about the characters he was writing. That's a great resource for me. When I'm trying to find monologues, especially Shakespeare, um, and I want to look into plays that I haven't read before, I don't have much exposure to, I love this book called Speak the Speech. It's, um, it's an actor's toolkit. I mean, it, it really, I'll kind of just throw it up here real quick. Um, it's really, really solid book. It has all of these monologues. It has uh, a lot of commentary about the play, about you know what uh, what's happening. It kind of is the uh, thing that should capture your interest to then go read that play. Um, then once I've had a monologue and I have it in my head and I know what I'm doing, I'm starting to do the the real text analysis. I always go to Shakespeare's words. This book is amazing for a lot of reasons. It's written by a father son duo um, who just have a love for the craft and a love for the language and. Uh, they wrote this glossary. It's a very, it's very, it's a dictionary for the words, um, for Shakespeare's words. They also are online now. So there's a free resource for Shakespeare's words. Um, it's not as good is, as the book. The book is really incredible. And um, as you can probably see, I have coffee stains on this book, very much used and abused. Um, also Shakespeare's, uh, Shakespeare A to Z. Love this one. Uh, is an incredible book for a lot of reasons. This is like their, their tagline for this book is Shakespeare A to Z, the essential reference to his plays, his poems, his life and times and more. It's really an open-ended book. You're gonna, if you're looking at Hamlet, you're gonna read a lot about what was happening in Shakespeare's life when he was writing Hamlet, you know, and those things influence, just as we are artists today, the things that are happening in our world influence us and our work. This man was the same way. The things that were happening in his life influenced his work. He wrote about them. Um, so it's important to understand the history and where, where he was. This book really helped me do that. Um, also, the last thing really, uh, and this is something that I really got in school, so I don't expect a lot of you to have this resource, which is why I think to give it now, but uh, it's Edith Skinner. It speaks with distinction. Um, when it comes to language and, and it comes to my speech and how I deliver these lines, I really, really, really use this book all the time. And like m my speech teacher in college kind of changed my life uh, with this and also with her teaching. Um, so it's something I think you can, you know, if you get this book, you're definitely ahead of the, the game when it comes to uh, actors training. So those are my books um, wow. I keep them next to me and, and I love them very much. Yes, they are very useful. I yes. agree entirely. Uh, I also will recommend two books. It's pretty much one book, but it's split into two. Uh, it's yeah. called The Lexicons. Uh, yes, The Lexicons. Yeah. Um, this is similar to what Andrew was re referencing with the Shakespeare's words. Yeah. Um, but lexicons are really just Shakespeare dictionaries. Literally right. any word you've ever seen in a Shakespeare piece, you could look up in a lexicon. And it's good to do because honestly, a lot of the words that you see in Shakespeare's plays, you might think mean something today that had a completely different meaning when he wrote it. Exactly. Like the word wherefore. Exactly. So if you see in Shakespeare the word wherefore, you might think that that means like where or yeah, somewhere to. Right. But when you look it up in a lexicon, you realize it just means why. Right. So like when somebody says like, wherefore art thou? Or no, they wouldn't, they, 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 they would say like, uh, I, I am blanking right now, but 
No, no, we got you. I got Look you. in your speeches. Wherefore is why, and I would never have known that unless I had a lexicon. Right. So lexicons come because they're so huge. They come in like A through M and N through Z or whatever it is. So get right. both lexicons. Also a good example of that is that definitions change over time. So like Shakespeare created words, he invented words. The word assassination uh, in Mackers actually to him has a different meaning than what we identify as the current thing. Similar, but yet different and actually could influence a decision that could be made on how you as that character says that line because you've looked up well in Shakespeare's time it meant this and today it now means this right we understand yeah. the difference and it's no knowledge is power exactly knowledge is power if you have this knowledge it gives you more creative freedom to make choices that you may not have had available to you had you not really understood you know the etymology exactly. of that word or whatever so Look, guys, you don't need any of this. You can just do Shakespeare however you think Shakespeare should be done. You are in the right to do that. Your choices without any of this knowledge are completely valid. And so is every other actor out there who's, you know, performing his words. Mm -hmm. You don't need this. But this is something that helped me. This is something that every advanced actor will tell you is essential to yeah. their Shakespeare approaching Shakespeare. And we just want to give it to you because it was given to us. Okay. Right. So when we talk about resources, the last resource and the most kind of available resource to you is us. Right. Call me, text me. Um, no, really though. You guys, some of you have called me. Um, we've emailed a lot of us. Um, obviously, those of you who are in sessions, we're obviously in touch. So continue to use us as a resource. Do not hesitate to email me a question. And if you have something for Andrew, just let me know so I can put you in contact with Andrew. But I'm sort of the official go through. Um, so if you have a question for Andrew specifically, just, just, just let me know. I'll make sure Andrew connects with you, but he, he coaches a lot of people as well. And he, he does other stuff too. So he's kind of on an as needed basis. Um, right. so I want to thank Andrew for being here tonight. Thank you so much, Andrew, for your knowledge, sure. and for your, what you do, your commitment to the work and your willingness to share. You, you do Absolutely. fantastic with, with all these, um, students. Thank you. Um, and with that being said, I personally thank everybody. You guys are the reason why we're here. Uh, we know where you're at. We, we've been there. Thank you for being passionate about the work. Thank you for a, a showing up and, and watching this and taking notes. It shows that you want to be better. And I yeah. think that we underestimate like that schools want that. Schools don't want perfection. They want someone who is willing to put right. their full imaginative instrument to use. So I hope what you've learned tonight will help you put your imaginative instrument to use. Absolutely. It will help you play and it will help you make choices that, you know, bring your Shakespeare work up and more new, uniquely you and more authentic. And we'll see you in the coaching room. Hey All right, guys, have a great night. You guys can sign Bye, off. If you have any comments, leave them. And uh, I can't wait to hear from you. Yeah. See you soon. Bye. Signing off. <laughs>